Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. Today, it's my distinct pleasure to have Mike Domish with us. You may have seen Mike quoted in Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, or maybe you've seen him as a featured expert on a Dateline NBC special. For three decades, he's been one of the most sought after speakers in the world for addressing sexual consent, respect, and reducing sexual violence as the founder of the Center for Respect. His clients include the U.S. military, corporations, schools, and some of the country's most prestigious schools. During the first 12 months of COVID, when speaking shut down, Mike continued to stay busy on stages live virtually throughout the world, having given over 100 paid talks. With his company, Peak Impact Coaching, he is a speaking coach for impact-driven entrepreneurs who want to be more amazing from the stage. Mike quickly helps entrepreneurs discover their hidden gifts for catapulting their influence on stages, live, virtual, and on-site. Unlike many coaches who teach formulaic cookie-cutter systems, Mike ensures your uniqueness shines. Mike, it's so great to have you on the show. Thanks, Stefan, for having me here. It's an honor. I'd love for us to start with your origin story, how you ended up founding the Center for Respect and focusing on this important issue that I don't think gets enough attention. Um, especially in media and uh, you know, on stages and so forth. So maybe you could start there and then uh, help us to understand how you ended up uh, going into the professional speaking realm. Yeah, happy to share that. Well, you know, you don't grow up, at least in my era, you didn't grow up thinking about, oh, I'm going to live my life working to end sexual violence. You didn't even hear about that growing up. It wasn't mentioned in schools. Sexual assault was not mentioned in schools. If you ever heard about it, you heard about like in the nightly news and you heard about like somebody in a park or an alley. That's the only version you ever heard of. And so I go away to college and I receive a phone call. It's the start of my second year in college. Uh, and it's my mom telling me that my sister's been raped. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe what I'm hearing. I am in shock. I am outraged. I am lost, confused, hurt. And I'm just in check. Like, you know, you can get that phone call that someone's died. You prepare for that. Like, okay, I know that can happen in life. You don't prepare for this phone call. Like people don't tell you this could happen, especially back then. And what I would learn over that time, over the next few months, is that I was struggling to understand even what the, what the issue was, what the topic was. But I was furious what was done to my sister. But I didn't really understand the topic. And so as I started to look at what, my, what the perpetrator was being prosecuted for, and I looked at the laws, I started to go, wait a second, we were never taught that. We were never taught that without consent. What does that mean? Well, that tip, typically consent means you ask someone, right? If I need your consent for anything, I ask you. And I started to think, well, wait, we weren't taught that. So then if we weren't taught that, who was that? And started asking my friends, were you taught to ask? They're like, no one asked. And I would ask all genders. I'd be like, do you, do you ask or are you asked? Or like, no one ever asked me, are you kidding? That never happens. I started to go like, wait a second. Oh my gosh, we have a culture where this is rampant because people just assume what they can do with each other's bodies. And that's where the wake up occurred was because of the trauma and the harm that was done to my sister. It forced me to look into the law and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. The law and reality are two different worlds. So the law says this is the, the standard. Reality, nobody's following that standard. And that was a huge, massive wake-up call for me as an individual, not just to teach others. And then I would hear a speaker speak about it for the first time ever in my life. I was a college athlete required to go to this session. And I would go, wait a second, I can do something about this. And that's where it all really, really began. That's where it really hit home. So did you hear like a little voice in your head or something saying, get on stage and talk about this? Or like, was there some sort of moment that shifted everything for you to go from, okay, this is an important issue and nobody talks about this and that's not right to, okay, I'm the one, you know, if not me, then who, and if not now, then when? Yes, there was. So when I was listening to that speaker, I was surrounded with my teammates, my friends, and the speaker had said, you all know a survivor of rape or sexual assault. Now keep in mind, this is 1989, 1990-ish, and they're all like, no, I don't. Well, they knew my sister, right? But they just didn't know what they didn't know. And so I was sitting there going, oh my gosh, they don't even know how many survivors they know because we haven't created a safe environment for survivors to be able to talk about this, be able to come forward. And so they're just totally naive to this. 
I need to speak out about this. I need to use my voice. That was the moment when I realized, and I went up to the speaker and said, I want to speak on this. And anybody who's ever speaking professionally will tell you this is a common thing. Somebody comes up and goes, oh, I want to speak on this. And then you never hear from that person again. <laughs> that often happens. And he said, well, if you're really interested, he happened to live an hour away in, in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, meet up with me. I'll give you what I got. Well, I showed up. And he was like, nobody ever shows up. So he gave me everything he had. And I took all this data, all this research, and just started writing my first talk. And I went to my local high school where I graduated from and said to a teacher that I trusted, could I present this to the class? And thankfully, she trusted me. So she said, sure. And that's where it really began. And then after that session, it was my first time ever doing it. She's like, Mike, this is where you belong. This is what you should be doing. And that was really, really lit the fire at that point. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin. I went to school there and uh, I started my first business there. I have fond oh, wow. memories of Madison. Yep. <laughs> I have a son who lives there now, and I had another son who graduated from there. Yep. Yep. One of my, uh, one of my daughters uh, lives there now, too. Oh, cool. very so, cool. Small world. It is. It is. There are no coincidences. So I would love <laughs> to uh, hear some of the most important uh, stats or trends or uh, data points that you share in your talk for the sake of our listener who probably knows quite a number of survivors and just doesn't know who they are, but they're close friends, family members, et cetera, who have just never shared what happened to them. What are some of the most important uh, data points for that, for our listener or viewer to, to know and understand? So the research shows that three, uh, when, when we look at this topic, one in three, to one in four women will experience sexual assault by the age of 18 or to 21, depending on what research you look at. And when they look at men, they say one to six, one in six. Um, those are the numbers. Now, with that said, I don't share those numbers in my program because unfortunately what happens with human psychology is people go, oh, one in four? Well, that means one, two, three, not me. The odds mean this won't happen to me. It's a 25%. Now, 25% is horrendous. We all know that. But the mind plays to safety. And it says the big number is the 75%. So it doesn't engage the human psychology to talk about stats. And what I do is I say the opposite. I go, all right, let's put a, pull everybody into a room here. How many, let's say that everybody's been sexually active and everybody in the room is 22 and they've all been sexually active. And let's just say that I ask this room, how many of you have had a partner sexually advance on you without asking? Like they start touching, they start kissing. And maybe you said stop and they stopped, but they were already doing stuff. Out of this room of 100 sexually active people, how many people do you think are going to go, oh, of course, somebody's made a move on me without asking? What do you think the number is going to be, Stefan? 80, 90%. Yeah. Audiences actually say 95 to 100%. So that's personal because then people go, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, are you talking about, is that what sexual assault is? Somebody sexually engaging with you without me, without asking me? Now we have a conversation versus the stat, which they think, well, that didn't or did happen to me. And they only relate based on that versus, hey, you gave me a real example there that I can relate to that abs absolutely either I've done myself or has been done to me, neither of which I want. I don't want to do that to somebody else. I don't want to in any way form any kind of sexual violence or violate someone's boundaries. And I certainly don't want it to happen to me. So it really engages people in the conversation. So when we talk with parents about this, as an example, is the worst thing you can do as a parent is go, oh, this is how often it's happening. This is how often it's happening. And just stress those numbers versus talking about the nuances of how it's happening so that your child can recognize it before it happens or when it happens. Both are important. So you want to talk about the details versus just the scariness. Right. And so what would be some uh, actions for our listener to take? Let's say that, uh, you know, somebody is mar married happily for the last 10 or 20 years. They're not out there in the dating world and maybe they don't even have kids of dating age. Uh, what can they do? And then yeah. what can somebody do who is a parent who's listening to this? So I get to work a lot with the U.S. military all over the world. 
And sometimes those audiences are young. Sometimes those audiences, everybody in the room is 30 to 55 to 60. Uh, and they're married, like you just described, or they've been married. You'd be amazed how many times somebody in their 40s or early 50s or mid 50s come up to me and goes, Mike, during your session today was the first time I ever realized I have the right to say yes or no without guilt. They've been married 30 years and they were taught that they have to say yes out of guilt. Like that's my job versus I get to choose when I want to be sexually active. So even somebody who's been married a long time can think, well, our marriage is great. My partner never complains. And I'll pause and I'll say, okay, did you ask them for feedback? Did you give them any opportunity? Because if you didn't and they've never given feedback, there's usually one of three reasons this occurs. One, they don't think you can handle the feedback. In other words, you're going to give them sexual feedback and they think you're going to take it personal and you're going to be crushed. Two, they're afraid of your reaction. They think you could become violent. That's a real fear for some people. Or three, they've never been taught that it's okay to have a sexual voice. So of course, they're not expressing any sexual discussion with you because they've been taught that's not something you should ever use your voice for. So any of those are not healthy, any of them. So what we recommend people go home tonight is do is look your partner right in the eye and say, hey, what do I do that you really love? What do I do that you wish I didn't? Like, I don't want to do the things you don't want me to do. And what do you do? And what are things that I tend to do before, maybe even like leading up to that you don't like? Like, hey, just don't do that. I don't like that. And what are things you do like? What are things you do find attractive? And I have this open conversation and people go, what does that have to do with consent? Well, now I'm not going to try to talk you into or ask you for things I know you don't want to do. So healthy consent is not just getting someone's permission, which is the phrase we used to hear forever. Healthy consent is understanding, is this mutually wanted? So does my partner want to do this with me or have I talked them into doing this with me? And there's a lot of married sex happening that is talked into sex versus we both want this to occur. So that's on the marriage side. Now you asked also about, hey, what about how do we talk to our kids about this? And so one of the things we can do with our kids is, first of all, do have the conversation if this ever happens to them. Most parents do it this way. Anybody ever touches you, I'll kill them. And that's the kind of phrase that parents tend to roll with. Well, what does that do? That scares the kid from ever coming forward. Because now they think, well, if I come forward, I have to fear not only what happened to me, but what my parents are going to do next. Yeah, they'll go to jail. Versus saying, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, that's a really scary. Versus saying, if anybody ever sexually touches you against your will, without your consent, I am always going to be here for you. Always. Right? That's powerful because that says, I'm focused on you. The other version, I'm going to kill them, says I'm focused on the perpetrator. Well, I want my kid to know I'm focused on them. And I might even add on, no matter what choices you made that night, no matter how much you drank, no matter, I am going to be here for you. No one has the right to ever do that to you, right? So you can add that in there. And so those are just some subtle ones. There's a lot more we can get into, but those are just starting points. Yeah. I have this feeling that the one in three, one in four number is vastly underreported. I just have that yes, sense about it. it is. That, and uh, so part of the problem with that topic is it works around words like rape and sexual assault, which a lot of people truly don't understand. So even when they're answering the questions, it can be misunderstood in what they're answering to, right? You go back to the question I asked, have you had a partner, partner sexually touch you before they asked? Well, that's most people are like, yes, well, now suddenly we're at 90%, you know, whatever those numbers would be, that would be dramatically higher. Well, in most states, that'd be a fourth degree sexual assault or fourth degree sexual battery, depending on, you know, what they use in their state. But it's a form of sexual assault. Now, yeah, it's not the same as second degree or first degree. And that's where we have to have a conversation more. That that shouldn't be acceptable. No, it shouldn't be. And and I remember this, uh, this really important point. Uh, I don't remember where I learned it, but no is a complete sentence. That's correct. We talk about that. That's right. And that you should be able to say yes or no without guilt. It goes back to that statement I made earlier, because what a lot of parents will do is say, you always have the right to say no. You always have the right to say no. 
uh, and by the way, I say a lot. That's a lot of progressive parents will say that. And most parents aren't preaching that, which we need more of. But even lesser parents say, when you believe it's right for you, you should not feel guilty to say yes. Because if they do not feel safe saying yes, they'll play this, they'll play a game of, well, I can't say yes, but I want this. And consent gets very muddy, gets very confusing because I don't feel comfortable saying yes, but I want this to happen. So how do I get this to happen without me saying yes? And it gets, it's ugly and confusing. We don't want that. So we want somebody to be able to say yes. If they absolutely feel that comfortable wanting it, that they can enthusiastically say yes, I want them to say yes or no. That's part of consent, right? People hear consent and they think, no, 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 no. Consent's actually yes. So if people go, oh, I teach my kids consent. So you talked about how to say yes, right? Not just how to say no. You also taught them how to say yes. Yeah, that's great. Clarity is king and queen. Yes, it is. And and wow, what a great way to raise your kids and or to have uh, a long-term relationship, whether it's a marriage or domestic partnership or whatever, is to have that understanding that it's a, it's essentially, it's a, no or a yes, maybe maybe it's no and a hell yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's the best, without a and, doubt. <laughs> and then, you know, lack of clarity means it's not a yes yet. That's exactly correct. We use the phrase enthusiastic, enthusiastic yes, right? That's a huge, huge difference versus, and that's why we like the word mutual. Hmm. Because mutual says, you didn't talk me into this yes, I wanted this. And so a great question for a married person to ask their partners, what would you love for me to do in bed for you right now? Notice it's not, well, what can I do in bed tonight? Because that is what can I get away with almost, right? Versus what do you want? There's a massive difference. Or if your partner says no, and this is a, a tall tale, anybody watching this will relate to what I'm about to give as an example. You say to your partner, hey, you want to have sex tonight? What's the first word most partners say before, if, if they don't want to, what's the first word do you think they say? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Uh. <laughs> sorry, I'm not in the mood. Sorry, I'm not feeling well. Sorry, it's sorry. Uh. Sorry implies I owed you this and I should feel bad for not wanting it right now. Mm. So one of the things we want to teach our partners is don't be sorry. That's why I asked you. I don't want you to think you ever have to do this. I asked because I want to know that you want to do it or don't want to do it. So whatever, I don't want you to feel sorry. That's really powerful as an example to teach kids too. You know, you'd be amazed. So I get to speak in middle school and high schools all over the country. Students want this information. They want to have more tools to be empowered to be able to say yes or no in the right circumstances. Now, as soon as you say that, some parents freak out and go, what, 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 what? They're, they're all getting tools on how to ask for what they want. Yeah, but what does that also mean? They're going to have a new standard for whether they really want to do these things or not. The standard's going to be much higher. They're going to be more likely to say no because they're going to recognize the standard they're in is not healthy. Oh, this person's pressuring me. That goes against all mutuality we just learned in the assembly. This is a no. This is not something I want. Uh, it's okay for me to say no for the first time. So now I can say no anytime I want. So now I'm more empowered. And students say this over and over again. They feel more empowered to say no because now they have the skills. But when they have no skills, they're afraid to say anything. And the perpetrator tends to take advantage of that. And that's not, that is not the survivor's fault ever. So when students have more skills, when they're taught specific strategies and lessons, they feel way more empowered to honor their boundaries which means they're more likely to feel comfortable saying no when they absolutely do not think it's an ideal, awesome situation. And you ask most high schoolers, Stefan, is most sexual intimacy an awesome, incredible situation? They're like, nope. (laughs) There's often alcohol or drugs involved, back of cars, back of rooms and homes and parties. And if I wanted it the way I wanted it to occur, it would occur way less often because I'd want it to be a better circumstance. And so you'd actually be improving. Even when they look at sexual statistics of high school students, they seem to forget that a lot of the sexual experience students are talking about involves alcohol and drugs. So it wasn't even consensual necessarily. So we have to, so when people go, 50% of high schoolers have had sex or been sexually active or 70%. Oh, let's look at those numbers. 
how many of those were actually of sound mind? And the students are like, well, a lot of those cases were not of sound mind. So we didn't have consent because they were incapable of giving consent. So, you know, those are the deeper conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important topics. Now, uh, one thing I don't know if you cover in your talks or not, but I'd love to hear about it is this idea of having a giving energy versus a taking energy when you show up for your partner or on a date or whatever. If you're if you have an agenda and you're looking to get something, that's a taking energy and that's being broadcast from miles away versus, oh, I just want to give, you know, I want my partner to feel loved and safe, protected, cared for, nourished. Uh, I want her to uh, feel pampered. I just want to like take care of her. So I'm going to offer her a massage with a, a very clear, lots of clarity around like there's no agenda here. I just want to give to you. And if it leads to something uh, sexual, no problem. Uh, great. You know, if it doesn't, no problem. Great. I'm, I'm happy either way. Uh, by the way, your video. Yes, just this changed. visual is up on purpose. That's right. Just in case anybody's All watching right. this, uh, it is very intentional <laughs> because it's going to address this issue. Uh, so this is a slope of sexual activity. You ask most people, what's worst case scenario? It's going to go right into your giving and taking energy. And they'll say worst case scenario is sexual assault, which could lead even to murder. That's worst case. I say, what's the extreme opposite of that? Involving sexual activity. The number one answer we get, Stefan, is, well, consent. That's not true. Consent's not the standard of excellence. It's the bare minimum requirement. The bare minimum requirement. So then the question is, well, what's the standard of excellence? Well, the standard of excellence is mutually amazing consensual sexual intimacy, which means it's not about me getting some. It's about the two of us having an amazing mutual experience together. That's night and day difference energy, right? And, and my approach of trying to get some versus it changes everything. The problem is most people don't even know what it takes to get there. Now, some will say they want it in marriage, but most people don't even know what it takes to get there. Like what are the steps they need to be able to get to that? Like respect, like trust, like knowledge, attraction, all these key components that we don't talk about so people don't understand what mutuality and mutual energy looks like. They're not even aware. You know, things like having oral communication, not just communication, but oral communication. That becomes pivotally important to the energy because here's one of the dangers, Stefan, that actually happens in our world. So I'm glad you brought this up. A lot of people in this area have been taught to arrive with giving. And they are the ones that predators look for. Mm -hmm. So there's this balance of I don't want to come in with a peer giving or a peer taking. I want to come in with a mutual. It changes the parameters. If I come in with a pure giving, I'll do whatever this person wants to keep them happy. That's the danger. And even if I don't want to do something, well, I'm supposed to because I'm, I'm a giver. And that's how that will often be used in sexual situations. Mm -hmm. Versus... It's almost like uh, giving with boundaries. Yes. The giving energy with boundaries so that you're not uh, allowing yourself to get taken advantage of, but you're also not in a place of trying to manipulate or take something from the other. Correct. Well, and that's why the word mutual works really well, because we're both giving, right? Mm -hmm. We're both giving. And by the way, we're both receiving. This is the beautiful part about gifting to each other. You both get to receive. You both get to give. Now, there are times where you might think, I'm not in the receiving mode tonight, but I'm good to give. And that's okay because you're making the choice. That, that's a dramatic difference than somebody thinking, well, I have to. I went this far with them, or I'm married to them, or... I have to, that's different than only giving in those situations because that's not, it doesn't feel like a choice. It feels like a requirement. So that's the massive difference is, are you coming in with a mutual mindset of, yeah. are we going to have a mutually wonderful experience tonight? And where are the red flags? What's missing here? It doesn't seem to be a trusting situation or it doesn't seem this is, seems like they want this and I want that. Well, that's not mutual. So it's understanding where those red flags are. So either we can work through them or we can just stop and go, this isn't a good fit. Not in this moment, not at this time, or not with this person. And we can recognize that sooner. Yeah. It seems like uh, this is a good place to insert something I learned from uh, Betty Spruill. 
Yeah, it might have been Betty Spruill that I learned this from. So responsibility is being response able. It doesn't have anything to do with duty or obligation. So when you teach uh, a, a teenager or a young adult how to be responsible in, in these sorts of situations, it's, it's being responsible able and it has nothing to do with any kind of duty or obligation that uh, they might believe they have, whether they're in a committed relationship or just on a first date. And so if uh, they just relinquish all these uh, preconceived notions around duty and obligation, then they're free to make choices that just uh, fit for them, are, are you know, joyful for them and, and not from a place of coercion or uh, being kind of backed into a corner. Yeah. Well, and that goes back to, you made a comment earlier. And I know you didn't mean it this way, but I could, it's in case somebody was listening, I just want to address it. You had said, so they don't allow that to happen to them, which I know you didn't mean it as in their fault if it happens to them, but, right, right. but people will hear that and think, well, you made that choice. So you allowed that to take place. Well, that's not how it works because I could be somebody who's more passive, not have any education on this, and I won't be sexually assaulted unless somebody sexually assaults me. So the only way sexual assault happens is if somebody commits sexual violence on another person, no matter what the other person did. And that's really important for people to understand because a lot of times around this topic, people go, well, I'm going to teach my kids not to do A, B, and C because if they don't do A, B, and C, this won't happen to them. There's no way you can guarantee that. They could do A, B, and C and still be sexually assaulted and they didn't allow it. It's just, unfortunately, this other person committed a crime. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Very important. Oh, yeah. Happy to so, share. So um, was there a particular nugget or, or pearl of wisdom that you received from that guy in Madison that blew your minds, that kind of changed everything for you? You got this huge stack of, uh, of papers or, you know, all this data and all, all these uh, uh, slides and so forth, whatever you got from him. Was there something that stands out to you that uh, was unexpected or, or particularly Well, pivotal? in that moment, the, the one that I referenced earlier was that everybody knows a survivor and recognize how many I did know in that moment was massive. Uh, and the other one was the idea of asking for consent. That's what really skyrocketed my passion. That's where I focused in. I'm known around that area, around consent. I was teaching asking, I've been doing this for 30 years and I was teaching asking first 30 years ago where now you hear about it very frequently. You did not hear about it for the first 15, 20 years of my work uh, on, on a whole lot of stages. And we were, I was saying that from the stage. So that was a massive one, the whole idea. Cause what I had to do was look in the mirror and go, wait a second, am I asking? And I don't have the right to be self-righteous if I'm not living my life the way that you should be treating partners and yourself. So I had to look myself in the mirror and go, wait, am I asking? So then I say to my friends, are you asking? They're like, well, who asked? And at that time, that might've been guys I was asking. Then I asked the women, are, are you being asked? Or are you asking? They're like, who asked? Right? It was such a foreign concept. So that was the light bulb was when you recognized, wow, one, I'm not alone and that society didn't teach me to do this. And then two, how messed up that is. And that's what really drove my work. Yeah. And I love what you said about, essentially what you said was, I'm going to walk my talk. Right. In order for me to be on stage talking about this with integrity, I need to embody all of the principles that I'm teaching. Yeah, and it I'm, was critical. I'm paraphrasing here, of course. No, no, so, no, but, no. But, yeah. And I was in college, so I was a dating age, you know? So you're like, wait, I'm on a date. I got to ask, right? And so, and, and got to not as in uh, that it's a burden, that that's what I want to do. I get that opportunity to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story that just happened this a few months ago, I was at a university, packed auditorium. It was all their, all their incoming class had to be there. And I can hear something being set up in the balcony during my program. And so I just stop and I go, it looks like somebody's adding to the conversation. What would you like to add? And first like, no, 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 the, the, the seas parted because this one person was the one talking. And so suddenly this one person, I could see who it was. And he goes, well, okay, I'll ask you what I set up here. I mean, do you actually ask your wife now, keep in mind, this is a packed auditorium. I think we had a thousand students in this beautiful auditorium. Everybody's like, boom, mic drop. They think he's got me, right? Like, what are the odds? And I go, well, that's very interesting because my wife doesn't travel with me 
But today she happens to be here with me. Now, I was on the East Coast. I was nowhere near home. And she was happened to be traveling. It was very rare. And I go, I'm not going to put her on the spot because she didn't ask to be put on the spot. But I will share with you the first time that we that I was having to go through this. All right. And this idea of am I going to ask or I'm not going to ask. I was alone and we were dancing to music. The lights were out. Candle was lit. And I'm like, you can either think that's corny or romantic, but that's what it was. And I'm like, I know I want to kiss her. I know I want to kiss her. And I think she wants me to kiss her. And I need to ask. And so I look her in the eyes and I start to stumble like, oh, how am I going to ask? And I'm just like, can I kiss you? She says, yes, we're making out. I don't care about asking anymore. I'm like, I'm not burdened by that at all. I'm thrilled. Later that night, I asked her, hey, that when I asked you, what did that feel like? Because that was my first time asking. She's like, well, at first, for a split mini second, it was awkward because I'd never been asked. But then I recognized what it felt like to be given a choice, what it felt like to know this person cared enough to want to give me a choice. And I recognized how much more romantic this was. And the cool part is I get to keep asking her because we've been married 27 years. So that's what I shared from the stage. The room goes crazy, right? And uh, it proves the point of that when you ask somebody, you're building the right kind of relationship. But here's a question to follow up to his answer. Hey, do you ask your wife? It implies, do you still ask, right? That's the implication. Right. And I always will ask, at what point did my partner stop deserving to have a choice? Mm. And the moment you ask that, married people, young people, everybody's like, yeah, well, of course, never. Well, then why would you stop asking? Why would you stop giving them a choice? Wow. Powerful. So I would love to switch gears a bit. Sure. That was a really mic drop moment, I think. So it's a good point to uh, <laughs> to <laughs> pivot here to public speaking. Yes. And talk about how um, for somebody that wants to share their message on a stage, whether it's professionally and get paid for it, or it's just, uh, you know, as a pro bono thing that, you know, as a, a charitable give to, to do this in, in, as a volunteer, what would be the most important thing for a person who is starting out? And what would be the most important f thing for somebody who's already done a lot of speeches uh, to, right, yeah. to do, well, to, to move them forward? Yeah, absolutely. So one, why are you on stage? Let's uh, go with a person starting out. And by the way, there's a lot of experienced speakers that don't answer that well. <laughs> like, well, I get booked to talk about this. Okay, great. But what are they walking out with? Well, they're, they're raising their awareness. Well, what are they doing differently? So here's a key question that I will ask people. What actions will your audience take within minutes of leaving that space? If they are able to, if they have the opportunity to, because of what they heard you say. And that's one that you'd be amazed experienced speakers can't answer and newcomers can't answer. Well, no, no, I'm going to tell my story or no, no, I'm going to raise their awareness on this or I'm going to motivate them to, yeah, what actions will they take? Because education, this is Spencer Herbert said this famous quote a long, long time ago. The purpose of education is not knowledge, it's action. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that means that when we're on a stage, it's to provoke action. We're teaching to provoke action. Otherwise, you're just entertainment. If you walk, if people walk out of that room and they go, that was awesome. They were funny. They, they were emotional. They took me on this trip. And I go, great. What are you going to use from that? Well, it really doesn't apply to me. Well, then that was pure entertainment. Yeah. It wasn't wow. anything you can use in your life. So, Well, you know, there are no coincidences. I, I believe that to be uh, true. And I just had a conversation like this with my oldest daughter just last night about knowledge without application, without action is essentially pointless. And it's, uh, it's in the action. It's in the doing. Like love does, love is doing. So if you're not taking action on the information that you're, uh, you're obtaining, it is uh, essentially pointless. Correct. So that then asks, goes, all right, what am I teaching them what, how to do, right? And that's the key versus am I raising awareness, right? Raising awareness can be done by me giving you a postcard, 
that has a few stats and your awareness is raised. Doesn't mean you're going to do anything about it. And nowadays with my topic, people know sexual assault is wrong. People know rape is wrong. People know that consent means asking first. It doesn't mean they're asking first. So the, the, my job is to help them shift that to action and them walking out of the program going, I can't wait to ask. I can't wait to intervene. I can't wait. Not I have to, I must. I can't wait. Like they're looking forward to it. That's what you want your audience to be able to do. What is your audience going to look forward to doing when they leave that room because of what you shared? So that is true whether you are a first timer or you've been doing this a long, long time. That's a starting point. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I got uh, such an epiphany from what you were saying a few, a few <coughs> minutes ago about asking for the kiss and that it actually is more romantic to do so. Well, and that's just it. When you show it, it really makes a difference. So often, this is another sin of the stage. You're telling, not showing. So if you're telling, I think it sounds nice, but I don't see visually, feel how it's applicable to me. But when you show me, I go, I want that in my life, right? Yeah. So if I tell you how to swing a golf club versus if you show me how, or I show you how, you're going to get way more out of show. So an example of this is after I give the steps on how to ask for a kiss, I bring a student on stage. And have them, and when I say a student, this could be a 55-year-old general in the U.S. military when I'm with the military. This could be a 14-year-old high school freshman, it just whoever's in the audience. I bring somebody on stage and I say, the microphone in front of you is your partner. All you got to do is ask them for a kiss. You already got the steps. You saw me just do them. Here we go. We're going to count to three. The audience counts to three. The person asks. And what happens is you hear the room go, oh, the same room that 35 minutes ago said no one asked. It's going to ruin the moment. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be weird. It's sitting there going, I want that because they got to see it. They got yeah. to see it. And that makes the difference. So that's, and that's true of all speaking. Are you showing it or are you purely telling it? Mm -hmm. So good. So good. And when you uh, addressed that essentially heckler <laughs> in the audience and and you spoke about your wife being on the trip was she there in the auditorium with you literally in the auditorium like the every head of every student whipped looking for her. you could just see them like no way because keep in mind i was 45 minutes into the keynote that we were having a blast every we were all on the same page the energy was sensational that day so as soon as i said well she happens to be here and i just pointed outward everybody was whoom, looking so she knew at that point, she did. She's like, I gotta raise my hand just to stop the, you know, so they know where I'm at. <laughs> and so she did, she was with the way back and they just went, they loved it, right? Because it was real, but that is super rare. She doesn't typically get to travel with me at all my events. Yeah, well, again, no coincidences. Exactly. That was the, the speech where she was uh, with you. Really yeah, cool. it, was, it was wonderful. Yeah, and, and so how do you create these surprise and delight type of moments? How do you build them into a presentation in a predictable way like that's something Great that you question. you just kind of spontaneously um uh just walked into essentially i mean it was like the universe conspired to make it all happen for you but can't you uh with intention create those kind of magic moments time after time after time as part of your signature speech yeah i do so, and it's one of the things I love coaching impact driven entrepreneurs to do is how do you make this consistent? And it is consistent and it's feeling spontaneous. So that's critical. And because the moment as a speaker, this is another sin of the stage. The moment a speaker is in rhythm and routine and it, the audience in any way feels like this has been done before, this isn't special. Mm -hmm. I'm just a copycat of something that's been done before. They have to feel it's fresh and in the moment. And it is because every audience is different. Every audience is unique. And so it's learning. And that's one of the things that is neat to do when you're working with entrepreneurs is teaching them how to set yourself up for those wins, for those moments that take place. So, you know, when, when I have that person on stage asking, I have a very systematic way that they're taught to ask to make them win, right? Set them up for a win. You've got to have that. So your audience is winning. 
you're winning. Because otherwise, if it's just about you winning, you're just trying to be the smartest person in the room. And they'll walk out going, of course it works for them. Of course, because they're them. But you want everybody walking out going, oh, well, of course this works for everybody. This is such common sense. How did we not hear it before today? That's what you want your audience doing. Because that means you made it so simple, there's no confusion. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you another sin of the stage. There's an hour line waiting to talk to the speaker after they spoke. Yep. Why is that line an hour long? Now, there's two reasons. One, I purely bought my book signed because I'm excited to meet the person. Cool. That's a, good, that's a good reason. But that's not usually the reason. The speaker ripped off a Band-Aid somewhere during that speech that they did not give the audience a new Band-Aid to put on. And so that line is that long because they're a savior complex. I need to talk to the speaker to help me overcome whatever is hurting right now, whatever wound is still open. And so I see the speaker as a savior versus myself being the savior. All right. And so I need to get in that line because I'm hurting right now. That is a common thing that happens. It's one of, once again, when we're working with entrepreneurs, we want to teach them you don't rip off the band aid without healing the wound at, by the end. Wow. That kind of goes against uh, popular sales techniques of stretching the gap between their current state and the desired end state and re really poking at the pain points to, uh, I don't know, motivate action. Yeah. Well, this is what's interesting. Our, so we survey all of our audiences. So we have a post-event survey that occurs in the last 10 minutes of the speech. So it's, it's very live. Our numbers of I'm more likely to ask first, I'm more likely to intervene, I'm more likely, actionable questions, I'm more likely to reach out to loved ones, let them know I'm here for there. Our average number for middle schools, high schools, universities, and the U.S. military is 93 to 97% are more likely to ask, more likely to intervene without having to hurt the audience. So for, and, and this is one of the problems. We have a sales strategy from the stage versus an impact strategy from the stage. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, the people who work for me are not coming, who are hiring me to coach, are not coming to me because they want to sell from the stage. The one, in fact, I, we have somebody in our program right now. He sold 16 million from the stage, 16 million. And you know what he said? He said, I'm sick of selling from the stage. I want to have an impact from the stage. Because we all know what you just described is true. The selling approach means you need my book to actually heal yourself. You need right. my course to heal yourself. You need this other thing to heal yourself. So right. I'm or intentionally consulting. leaving you hurt intentionally when you have that strategy versus I'm here to serve the audience. Mm. It's so and, important. And, and they get away with it in the public seminar space because it's their event. You can't do that when companies are hiring you or schools are hiring you because they're hiring you to solve the problem, yeah. not to cause more harm. Yeah. Yeah. The intention is to essentially reveal light. And in that you have an impact versus, uh, you know, poke at the pain points. Correct. And yeah. these, these are my topic is a topic. If you're poking at pain points just to poke, it's cruel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of something I learned in Kabbalah. It's actually just uh, generally in Judaism is you can't perform a mitzvah while simultaneously doing harm. So yeah, a mitzvah is like, a, yeah, it's a, something that that it gets you blessings saying a prayer yeah, or doing something that's uh you know, a good work and you don't get brownie points if you're also doing harm at the same time and it can be as simple as well my wife asked me to do the dishes and i'm not going to do that because i'm i'm uh, going to go uh do my prayers now because it's you know the morning and that's when i do my prayers no brownie points for you for doing your prayers yeah i I love that stuff and I love it because we have a phrase of the intention is to do no harm. That's one of my phrases when I'm trained is to do no harm. Now that doesn't mean you will never do harm because it's impossible to know that you will never do harm. But the intention is to do no harm. So the moment a strategy in your speech says, oh, do this to get here and this is something that's not positive, we don't do that. We say, what else can we do there to get here? Mm -hmm. That's great. So what are some of the preparations that you do to have just a 
uh, a home run sort of experience with with a speech, whether it's uh, as I said, paid or uh, pro bono, uh, just a am amateur kind of impromptu thing or whatever. What do you do that really helps guarantee uh, success for you? This is where systems are critical. Mm -hmm. So I am all about the systems. And what I mean by that is every client who works with us gets sent to a downloads page that gives them everything they could ever imagine they would need when they bring me to speak. So there's a downloads page of all the different kinds of introductions. There's a downloads page of the stage setup with all the details of where the table is, where the chair is, two bottles of water is, because they would rather say, have you say, please, two bottles of water, because then they feel like everything's covered. If you don't put water, like, does he need water? Does he not need water? So you just say two bottles of water. You put everything there. Uh, this, the table should be this way, not that way, you know, not horizontal versus vertical. We put that kind of detail in there so they think, oh, okay, we just follow the instructions here. We don't have to think. That's the key to your success is setting up the room in a way that you know is going to be the most successful likelihood outcome. And that's what we're looking to do because so many speakers do not realize the room setup is critical to the energy in the room. I'll give you one of the biggest mistakes. There's a 10-foot gap from the stage to the first row. Massive mistake. Why do comedy clubs have the chairs right up against the stage? There's a reason. Because they know that energy is psychologically flows and it's contagious. So if you are right there with me at the, at the front, your energy is with my energy. We are right there together. So me as the speaker and you, we're, we are coming together. Now, you're right there and everybody's crammed right next to you. What happens? You start to laugh. Oh, they start to laugh. And now we're all having this unified experience. So th that kind of detail we're thinking about. How are we making sure the room is set up for a unified experience where everybody's in an intimate setting? There could be a thousand people in the room and it's still super intimate because it's the right setup. Yeah, and so it's, it's giving them all the groundwork to do that for you. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of something I, I learned about how David Lee Roth, Van Halen, would uh, make sure that everything was properly in order for their performances. Uh, there was a clause in the contracts that said, no brown M&Ms. I want a jar or a, a bowl of M&Ms in my dressing room and no brown M&Ms in there. It yes, seems and weird, right? But then my understanding of the brilliance of that was in the explanation of what his motivation was. Because if there were brown M&Ms in that bowl, then he knew to go check the lights and make sure everything was copacetic. Because if the complex uh, light setup was not done well, someone could actually die. Which happened. And that's what led to that. So uh -huh. not their concert, but another major concert in the country, another major band had a stage collapse that killed people. I believe it was in Cleveland, if I remember right. And that's what led to bands going, all right, how are we going to avoid that? And so that's what led to the M&M clauses you hear about. And people thought, oh, they're being divas. Nope. They're just looking to see are the details being taken care of. That's what that was actually about. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, some uh, preparations that I was thinking you might talk about maybe like uh, do some breathing exercise or some Qigong or, or some uh, affirmations, uh, incantations as Tony Robbins calls them before getting on stage to get your energy up. Is there anything in, in, in that that you would recommend? I absolutely recommend it if somebody's able to make that happen. So here's what I found over the years inconsistency in what happens in the final five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 seconds. So if you, if you say, well, this is what preps me and you don't get to do that, the mind now says you're not ready. Uh -huh. You're not full. So you have to be careful of putting a system in that cannot be reliably done all the time. And so what'll happen to me is somebody come up stage 30 seconds before, all right, we're getting ready. And they'll come up to me on stage four minutes before that. We're getting ready. And you might have said the last five minutes I like to prep, but somebody's worried about something. The students aren't here yet. Can we delay? And so suddenly the system doesn't work. So we make sure that I don't put systems in. So what I try to do is just say, take a moment, take a breath, and focus for what I can do in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. I, I do absolutely believe in energy and where we're at. So I like to focus and I like to talk, think about, and I learned this from my friend, Sean Stevenson. We we literally grew up building our business together in 
back in the in the early 2000s uh, when we were really taking off. And uh, it was to think about sending love to the audience, going out there with love for the audience, and just to take that moment that I'm present for them right now. Yeah, Sean is all about love. I had him on this podcast, and that was oh, such a, awesome. great, a great episode. Yeah, so for our listener who's not familiar with him, I recommend listening to that episode. But um, I'll also say that for those who don't know, uh, he he passed. So he's on the other side of the veil now. Yeah. He's up in, in heaven, smiling down on us. Um, but wow, what a beautiful, beautiful soul. Absolutely. And we spent, uh, literally when our speaking business were taking off, we'd be on the phone till 4 a.m. just building our websites. Because back then you had to figure it out yourself. Uh, it was so, you know, to over tw 20 years ago now, going on 20 years ago now. But uh, yeah, absolute amazing soul, incredible human being and, and, and a gift to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, last question before we wrap up, where does improvisation fit into the system or does it, is it essential, an essential component? I've personally never taken improv classes. My wife, Ryan has, uh, and it's definitely helped her. It feels uncomfortable to me. Not that I don't like being uncomfortable. I, I, really relish the, the uh, opportunities to become more comfortable with the uncomfortable. But that's something that it just hasn't really spoken to me like, all right, you got to do improv classes now, stuff. And, and so I haven't. I'm curious what your take is on that. My take is that if, if you're not looking to do improv or you wouldn't enjoy that, then I'm going to give you a different exercise that I teach all my clients, the okay. what if exercise. So the what if exercise is to everything in your speech, ask yourself, what if they said this at that moment? What are all the possible thoughts the audience could have at that moment? What if they yelled it out? And if you play that game out, you're being very improv oriented because you're thinking, what could I say? What could I do? And that by doing that, if it ever happens, you're ready. And mm -hmm. so it allows you to be very fresh and quick on your feet because you've practiced this. A lot of improv is not improv, right? We know that. Does Saturday Night Live rehearse? Yes. Does Second City in Chicago rehearse? Yes. Do they also use improv? Yes. Right. So uh, the thing to keep in mind is it's about rehearsal more than anything and not just rehearsing the script because anybody can memorize the script, rehearsing the feeling, changing how every word sounds each time you do it differently uh, so that you're actually giving it a different opportunity to land a different way versus just am I memorizing the words? Right. Fresh, not rote or exactly, uh, you know, kind of autopilot. If I threw the script out, could you still teach me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the benefits of slides that doesn't get enough credit is like a slide isn't a, um, it's, some, it's not something you read off to, to the audience. That's terrible. It, Which we it, see all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's something that's a, a reminder or trigger a, a, a waypoint for the speaker so that they don't have to have cards in front of them or they don't have to, you know, rack their brain trying to pull something. So out I'm going to, I'm going to throw a differentiator there. I'm going to okay. say that that is not ideal. All right. If the slide shows up before it's timing of exactly when it's meant to reinforce what I already said, it's stealing the show. Ah, uh, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what I do or whenever possible, again, you can't always control your environment, but right. if you have a, uh, I guess it's called a confidence monitor in many cases, you have a monitor that you don't have to look back behind you uh, at the screen that everyone else is seeing. You can look forward and then you just kind of uh, cheat your eyes a little bit so that you can see what not only the current slide is, but the next slide Correct, because the current slide you shouldn't care about. You've already talked about it. Yeah. And so you should, if you're going to do that, it should only be for the next slide. And here's critically important information. That confidence monitor better be at eye level. Right. In other words, it should be back of the room. So you're looking through the audience to see it, not uh, down on the stage. Because the moment you take your eyes down to get information, the audience disconnects from you. Mm. Great point. And so many places have the confidence monitor down at the uh, front of the stage. And so you, you have to uh, look down and that's that's a really critical point. Now, Genius yeah. Network, uh, they have the, the confidence monitor in the back of the room uh, um, on the wall. Correct. They have it perfectly uh, located. Yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome. What a great way to end this. Now, if our listener or viewer is intrigued, interested, motivated, hopefully to learn more and apply that in their lives and businesses in terms of the the speaking that they might be doing or, you know, considering, where do they go? And also where should they go if they're interested in learning more about what we spoke about in the first half of this episode around respect and consent and uh, romance? Yeah. Well, I'll start with the question you asked first, which is if they do want to get more speaker coaching and they'd love to that kind of energy that I bring, if they want to work with me on doing that, I provide workshops where they can join me live virtually and we dive deep and quickly and they can just go to peak impact coaching, peak impact coaching.com for that. Now, if they're looking to talk about consent and mutually amazing relationships and talking to their kids, that's all the center for respect. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Center for respect.com all spelled out center of the word and then the word for and then respect.com. So center for respect.com. They'll find us same with social media. Uh, we're, we have center for respect everywhere on Facebook and many other places. So super easy to get a hold of us. Awesome. Mike, this was such a, such a pleasure and really fun and inspiring and, I'm going to apply what I've learned and I hope our listener does as well. And we'll get you on the next episode, listener. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.